Hi, my name is Amy and thank you very much for watching. So it is after my bedtime and that is when we are starting today's video. So today will be another day that we don't actually get through an hour of this video, but um, every day we're going to be doing at least some of this because otherwise we will give up and not get through it at all. So um, one hour every day was a little ambitious on my part and I'm behind on everything. So, let's get started. We are at 158.55, and we are about to start with Remix. Security from their own protocols. Rollups derive their security from the base layers. So Arbitrum and Optimism, for example, is gonna be just about as secure as Ethereum. There's some fantastic guys in there that go a little bit deeper into rollups, and I've left a link in the description for you. All right, so we just talked about a lot of stuff. So let's do a quick recap before moving on. Ethereum and Bitcoin are... Yeah, we started, I said yesterday, I was like, we should just watch this recap again today because I was super tired yesterday. So there's that. Currently both proof of work blockchains that follow Nakamoto consensus. However, Ethereum is moving to Ethereum 2, which will be a proof-of-stake sharded blockchain. Sybil attacks are prevented due to protocols like proof-of-work and proof-of-stake. 51% attacks grow increasingly harder with the size of blockchain, so you should run a node. Consensus is the mechanism that allows a blockchain to agree upon what the state of the blockchain is. Sharding and rollups are solutions to scalability issues on layer 1s. A layer 1 is any base blockchain implementation, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. That is misspelled, it's bothering me. Scalability B, I guess. Blockchain scalability problem is that there's not always enough block space for the amount of transactions that want to get in them. This leads to very high gas prices. And again, gas prices are how much it costs to interact with a blockchain. Whew. So that's it for the blockchain basics and the blockchain explainers. With just this information, you now can go off into the world and start working with blockchains and interacting with blockchains with at least some level of knowledge as to what's going on. You should be incredibly proud of yourself for just making it this far. Definitely be sure to give yourself a pat on the back. That was definitely my second night alarm telling me to go to bed. But hey, uh, my cat is going to tell me again and again that it's time for us to go to bed. Um... And a round of applause. Now that we've gotten a lot of the basics and the fundamentals out of the way, let's start jumping into the coding aspect. This is where you're gonna learn how to actually build these smart contracts, how to build these trust minimized agreements in these blockchains and in these smart contract platforms. This next section, this Solidity Basics, the Solidity Fundamentals section, will give you all the skills to start actually coding Solidity and understanding how these smart contracts work underneath the hood. So at this point, absolutely give yourself a high five, maybe say hi in the GitHub discussions, maybe say hi in the community on Twitter, on Reddit, etc., and be proud of just making it this far. The journey has really only just begun, but you've already learned so much. Let's begin. The we made it to the first summit. It gets way harder after this, I guarantee it. Next section, and let's jump into the code. Welcome to Remix. Now that we're getting to the coding sections, I need to stress to absolutely use the GitHub repository associated with this course. If you come to the GitHub repo and you scroll down and you click the lesson that we're on, right now we're on lesson two, welcome to Remix, simple storage. If you click on it, it'll give you a ton of timestamps and, and other helpful links associated with this lesson. Additionally, the biggest piece is that all the code will be available right underneath the lesson title. This one. Oh, this is dumb. I mean, not dumb, or a little dumb. So you have a repo that's not code. That's just resources. So we go down to lesson two, and then we have a different repo that is the code that we probably should have had in the first place. So get clone. Uh, 
you know what? Uh, I know how to sell, spell stuff, so. Okay. So if we come here and I don't know what that web three folder is. So add folder to workspace. We're gonna go to code. Oh, never mind. That's what the web three is. We'll come here. Um my first naive reaction is that this is literally one solidity file um so this is the name of the contract um oh in p in not php in pearl the first line would be a shebang but these are just comments. Um, apparently, I think we need to have between 8.0 and less just less than 9. This, they'll probably tell us where to get it. This is me just trying to understand the code without any influence of anybody else. Um, so, like, people is an array of people oh okay well it says that but this looks like kind of like typescript mapping string um this is an unassigned integer so only only positive numbers 0 to 255 Name to favorite number. Okay. So I don't know what this mapping is. Is there. Okay. Mapping is literally anything. Um, so there's a function add person. It takes in memory name. Oh, sorry. No. It takes up memory. Has a name and the favorite number. And then it pushes the person, the favorite. So people is an object. People is a new object so this is like an object of objects this is an array people is an array we're pushing the people object with the attribute of favorite number and name and then we are mapping the f okay that makes sense yeah so that literally is how you call it with a hash with the underscore name and then we just make the name equal to the favorite number so if we did people it would just come back with a favorite number um, so this is complicated but not too bad of course this is like a simple solution simple problem but not so bad okay so we made it one minute into two hours we're good we'll have all the code that we're going to be working with as well as some more additional information on how to work with the code please when asking questions and entering in discussions though please ask your questions in the full blockchain solidity course repository thank you
And if we're at the top of the repository and we scroll down, we have this resources for this course section, which brings us to the GitHub discussions, which you can ask questions in the GitHub discussion section of this course. Additionally, on Stack Exchange Ethereum or Stack Overflow. I'll talk a little bit about how to format. I didn't realize this before, but Stack Exchange Ethereum, they have like, Ethereum has its own Stack Exchange. Wow, okay questions and ask questions the best way so that you have the highest chance of getting a good answer in a later lesson. I highly recommend you pause and make accounts for Stack Exchange Ethereum, Stack Overflow, and GitHub right now if you haven't already. Links to them, of course, can be found in our GitHub. I do not have a account for either, sta either Stack ex Exchanges. I'm usually late enough that everyone's asked any question they want to ask or we can find it. So we'll try to keep that streak. Repository. Typically for each coding section, I'll start it off by giving a quick overview of the code of what we're gonna be working with and what we're gonna be building towards. Since everything that we're doing is gonna be project-based and that's how we're gonna learn. For our first one in Remix though, we're gonna skip over that because there's a lot of stuff to get used to. Now, I highly recommend that as I'm coding this and as I'm doing all this in Remix, you follow along with me and you code along with me. Remember, you can change. Of course, I'm going to code along with you. Change my speed if I'm coding too fast or if I'm coding too slow. To start, we're gonna jump into a tool called Remix. If you're unsure how to get there, there's a link to Remix in our GitHub repository. I have no idea what Remix even is. Mm, is this so it's remix.ethereum.org okay I'm seeing the scam alert we beware of online video promoting liquidity front runner bots um, yeah sure so this is going to go down here. I'm assuming this is just the GUI for um, what we're using. Like you basically just drop in the Solidity file and it works. Eh? Yeah. Well, this is not what we want. Um, I'm not. I'm not sponsored by Otter. But I am using it to uh, do transcription because it makes it much easier when I go to review the next day to make my blog, which I guess we can go to that as well because I did a sh I did a bad um, a bad review today. I'm gonna go back and edit it, but yeah, we've done. But this is the fifth day, but um, we started with recap one instead of a day zero. So um, we're going to post today's video tomorrow. Uh, that's just the, um, that, that's, <laughs> that's the cadence I've chosen. And I started this at, we're going to go through me doing this for one hour a day but um today was busy so i'm going to go until our first commercial break and then we will have done five minutes of this video today and um these courses are like dieting or like some days are just going to be not what you want uh, yesterday was Memorial Day and a holiday, so, I mean, it is what it is, so we'll just keep, when we can, do one hour a night. Um, one hour, I think, from now on is just the max, no, no more than one hour a day. Um, so, I've just spent a really long time explaining to you that I don't, like, I do want to be here, but... It's getting close to midnight for me, and I would like to 
uh, wind down so that I can go to bed so that I can go to work tomorrow. Right. This is where we're going to be writing all of our code. So welcome to the Remix IDE. Or in Okay, so this is this is an IDE. Why are we okay? Integrated development environment. This is where we're gonna learn how to code and interact with our smart contracts. If you want, you can go ahead and accept help out remix. If you've never been here before, it'll give you a quick walkthrough of some of the Why didn't it give me Jerk, why didn't you give me a did I just miss the pop up? Is that what's happening? Um, should I sign in? Nope, that is not that. So why are we using an online IDE? Is there not a remix that we can download in the iPhone app store? Nope, that is not a thing. That's weird. They should make a VS code. Um, where is the extensions? Oh, hey, look. They have an Ethereum Remix plugin. Um, yeah, we should probably just do this instead of being on Ethereum. Or instead of being in Remix. Okay, this is me just not saying anything. So, this is in beta. Um, you need to have at least a folder open or workspace. Compiling Solidity and Yule. It provides basic functionality to get started with Solidity and Yule development. Quite a few remix plugins use the result of compilation to generate content for you. So this is extremely useful. Um, you can compile your files using two methods, uh, the internal remix compiler and the compiler by the extension. Um, okay, so open a Solidity file. Your mission should you choose to accept it here and then am I going to miss the, the rest of that information because VS code can be a little trash yes yes I am um, okay so open up the, oh, this is a lot of instructions. I also wonder if, if uh, Patrick is going to get to this. So open a Solidity file in the editor and click on compile should be able to select a file to compile. Compile where? Which menu?
Well, why don't we quit VS Code? Goodbye, VS Code. And do we have looking for they said that there should be sure but did I just corrupt everything go me okay fine we will go along with Patrick. Sorry, Patrick. The tools that Remix actually has. We're going to skip over them for now because I'm going to explain everything that's going on. Remix is such a powerful tool because it has a lot of features that allow us to really see and interact with our smart contracts. Eventually, we're going to move. Okay, but why are we in the browser? Off of Remix, actually, to a local development environment. However, Remix is absolutely fantastic for learning the fundamentals of Solidity, and I highly recommend everybody start with Remix when they're getting started. When you come to the Remix IDE, there's a whole lot of different things that are popping out to us. There's a lot of different plugins as well. Since we're gonna be working with Solidity, which is gonna be the language that we're using to develop our smart contracts, we can go ahead and get started by clicking the Solidity plugin. And a couple of other tools will show up on the side. Even if you don't click the Solidity plugin, you'll still be able to code Solidity smart contracts. The left-hand side is where we're gonna to start to actually interact with things. The button on the topmost of the left is our files or explorer directories. Remix comes boilerplated with some different contracts, some different scripts, some different tests, and different dependencies. We are going to minimize this a little bit. So if you want to go ahead and right click and delete some of these folders, other than the contracts folders, feel free to do so. Or if you kind of like. Okay, that was a little quick for me. I don't know how to write. Oh, okay. I'm never writing a test. Well, I mean, you probably have to. Uh, what are you doing, Amy? You're doing English. Okay, so right click. I can definitely right click on the Mac. And you're sure? Oh, okay, we need to keep the scripts. We don't need tests. Who needs tests? We'll do tests later. Okay. Come there. Feel free to leave them as well. We're going to leave. Oh, we don't need scripts. A few scripts. We don't need you. Uh. Okay. These seem important. It's okay. We'll remake them by hand. Because developers love doing things by hand. Leave our contracts folder, and we're going to delete the different files inside of it, just so that we can start from a blank slate. So why don't we just delete the contracts file folder and create a new contracts folder? That's silly. So silly. We're going to delete all of this. Okay, so we have an empty contracts folder. We can delete the readme. It's definitely no longer most projects come with something known as a readme usually it's a readme.md which usually explains how to actually work with code but for our purposes we're going to delete this as well and you can just follow along with me okie dokie now we have a blank remix setup click on the contracts folder and click the little page icon to create a new file a little box will pop up and you can start typing text into it we're going to type in simple storage dot soul. 
Okay, well, we could have done Hello World. Um, I'm being antagonistic. It's fine. It's late. Uh, this one. Gonna create. Can we just right click and new file? Uh, simple. I'm assuming that there is a naming convention in staging storage dot soul. We've got a lot of soul. Um, that it is Pascal case. And Pascal just means the first letter is uppercase and any other words are also uppercase. It's like camel case except the uh, the first letter is also um, uppercase. Dot soul tells our compilers that this is going to be a solidity file and that we're going to code solidity in this. Solidity is the primary coding language of smart contracts. There are a few other smart contract languages for now languages as well, but Solidity by far is the most dominant smart contract coding language out there. And now we have a simple storage.soul contract on the right that we can actually start coding our Solidity with. So let's start coding some Solidity. Now, if you click on this button right below the files button, that looks like the Solidity logo, you'll see a bunch of stuff pop up in here. Let's see a bunch of stuff pop up. This sounds exciting. Also, apparently, that's the Solidity icon. Um, so I'm assuming that if we have doing Solidity 8.8, .8, and then I don't know what these these are. I think this is like something virtual machine. Um, and we can just manually compile. These are different parameters for us to actually compile our Solidity code so that we can run it. So the first thing that you're going to need in any Solidity smart contract is going to be the version of Solidity that you're going to use. And this should always be at the top of your Solidity code. Solidity is a constantly changing language and a constantly updating language because it's relatively new compared to other languages. We need to tell our code, hey, this is the version that I want you to use. We can add the Solidity version by doing pragma Solidity. I could look up what pragma means, but let's be pragmatic and just do it. P-R-A-G-M-A. Solidity, and I'm pretty sure it's 8.8.0. .8 this might need to be in double quotes. And then the version that we want to use. If we want to choose a very specific version, we could say 0 0.8.7. The most current version to date is 0 0.8.12, but getting used to different versions of Solidity. OK, just kidding. There's no quotations. Also, I did 8.9, but um, in here, it's 8.8. .8. The newest version is 8.12, so we'll just do 8, even though he has it. And then he did a semicolon. Do we need semicolons? Is Solidity dumb like that? Do you have to use semicolons in solidity. No. Wow, I have tried very hard to get out of doing semicolons. I am a life of no semicolons. Unhappy. Ugh. Really? Solidity? I'm going to have to start my war against semicolons with the Solidity crowd. It is good practice. And different versions of Solidity are considered more stable than others. 
0.8.7 is one of those versions that is considered more stable. These double slashes here are what's known as a comment. They're places where you can type stuff that won't actually get executed and won't get compiled and isn't really considered part of your code. For example, I could write, hello all, I'm Patrick. And if we were going to run this code, this part of my code would get completely ignored. So this double backslash is how we do what's called comments. And as we're coding and as we're building our projects. Um, okay. Now that I'm, I'm about to tell you this, let me make sure it's still true. So you do command shift and then uh, the backslash. Oh, wait, uh, let's go to something that actually has a, and then, what are we doing? Command and then the backslash. Oh no, I've forgotten how to do things. Like you don't have to do the back tick, the backslash to do, oh my gosh. Am I losing my mind about this? Um, so you can do it. Mm, there, okay. I'm not losing my mind. It's just not working on solo files. That's cool. Okay, that makes sense since it doesn't know about the extension in VS Code. But yeah, you use the command key and you use um, it's a, a CMD plus this and then it'll automatically create um, the comments on the line and the good thing about this when it works is like um, you do it down here and it does a different type of comment like it knows the type of comment that you can use in each section so it's just the easier way of doing this it's just late which is why I was like look at this cool trick oh shit it didn't work okay so can we yeah so since remix knows about how to read a soul file if you just use the command and the backslash it'll do the correct type of comments be sure to use this comments tool to your advantage every time you write a new function or you learn something that you didn't understand or you learn something new that you want to remember put it in a comment in your code you're going to be most comments are free and your code will be unreadable right like two seconds after you write it so there's that. It's effective at taking notes in this course by making them comments in your code and then saving your code so you can refer back to it later. So leave comments in your code, leave notes in your code, and that'll be one of the best ways for you to understand what you're coding when you want to refer back to it later. Now, when it comes to the... Um, technically, I uploaded my video today on time. It's just doing this video, it, it's run over to being the same day. And apparently we're, we're just never going to, um, we're never going to have a commercial break. And just because I said this, like two seconds after this, we're going to have one. But, um, yeah, I can only do 30 minutes of otter at a time because I have to, because we're going to use it for this course, I'm going to be purchasing Pro, so then we can do more than a half an hour at a time. Um, because now that we're in the coding stuff, we'll be more me and less just listening to Patrick. So um, it's annoying to have to stop the video every 30 minutes. There's actually a few different ways we can actually write it. We can say we want to use only 0 0.8.7, and this is how we would write that. But maybe we're okay if we use a more new version of Solidity than 0 0.8.7. To tell our code that we're okay with a more new version, we can put a little caret here. And this is how we tell Solidity, hey, any version of 0 0.8.7 and above is okay for this contract. This means 0 0.8.8 would work, 
0 0.8.9, 0 0.8.10, etc. But if we wanted to use just 0 0.8.7, we would type it like that. If we want to use solidity versions between a specific range, we could do something like this. We could say we want our solidity version greater than or equal to 0 0.8.7, but less than 0 0.9.0. This means that any compiler between 0.8.7 and 0.9.0 would work. This means 0.8.8 would work. Okay, we're actually going to write this out. Um, so, pragma solidity. Um, carrot is somewhere, yeah, it's above the 6. Okay, 8.8.8. .8 .8. And this means um, eight dot eight or higher. Um, pretty sure you can just use this for um, same meaning. And then, if you wanted to make it a range, it would be greater than or equal to 8.8, and then just basically like 9.0. And that just uh, makes a range. So that's cool. So I've been using this in package.json forever, and. Um, don't like it's one of those things where like, you learn the definition once and then you just kind of use it. 0.8.9 would work, 0.8.10 would work, but 0.9.0 would not work because it is not strictly less than 0.9.0. 0.9.1 would also not work. To keep things simple for us, we're going to use 0.8.8. .8. And every line of solidity that's completed, every completed section, needs to end with one of these semicolons. This is how you tell solidity. Oh, we can't have these all. We will have the real shebang. My cat is revolting. semicolon and then we'll do um, oh we really are just never going to have a thing. it's the end of the line also at the top of your code you're always going to want to put what's called an spdx license identifier this is optional but some compilers will flag you a warning that you don't have one this is to make licensing and sharing code a lot easier. We have a link to more about how licenses work in the section of this lesson in our GitHub repository. To do an SPDX license identifier, we just say SPDX license identifier, and we're gonna choose MIT. Oh my gosh. You couldn't have made this an acronym? And when comments, they really should just use like the shebang. Uh, no, sorry. At the top. Anyway. SPDX license identifier. Hopefully, none of you have spelling issues. Does that need a semicolon? The MIT license is one of the least restrictive. We will go into the lessons and um, look at the licenses, but yeah, MIT is pretty, pretty dope. Licenses out there, so we use the MIT license for most of our code samples. Once you have a version, and once you have just this much written, we can actually go ahead right to our compiler tab and scroll down and hit compile. Okay.
Okay, well maybe if I change this back to seven. Great. Parse error source file requires different compiler version. How about instead of eight, raise your hand if you saw that way before me. Um, I'm assuming the green check mark is a thing. That little turn thing will go, and in a minute, we'll see this contract is attempted to be compiled. Since we actually don't have a contract, we see no contract compiled yet, but we see the compiler automatically switched to 0.8.8. .8. Compiling our code means taking our more human readable code like Pragma Solidity and transforming it into computer code or very specific instructions for the computer to use. We'll go over what a lot of these machine level code or this computer level code is doing in a later section. If you're using a Mac, you can also hit Command S and it'll run the... Oh, you know, when I came into mine, it was at 8.7 and his is automatically at 8.8. .8, so I'm pretty sure he had this error and then just like didn't say anything about it because it's... Um, Just second win for it to him. I don't know what he's talking about. Command S or Control S. Oh, saves and compiles. What if it's not on automatic compile compilation? A compiler for you as well. On Windows, it might be Control S. We can actually choose the compiler version that we want to use. However, if we tell in our code to specifically use 0.8.8 .8, and we hit the compile button, it'll automatically switch to 0.8.8. .8. However, if we use the caret thing, we could specifically say, hey, we want 0.8.10. We could hit compile, and it'll compile with 0.8.10. Because again, remember, the caret says we want to use at least 0.8.8 .8, all the way up to the latest version of 0.8. For now, let's stay on 0.8.8. .8. The next thing that we're going to do in our code is define our contract. And to get a full screen view, you can go ahead and hit the compiler button to get rid of it there. To start defining our contract, we're going to go Okay. Oh, hey, look, we have a full page of this. Go ahead and write the word contract. Ooh. Contract. This tells Solidity that the next pieces of code is going to be a contract. Contract is a keyword in Solidity, and it tells our compiler that the next section of this code is going to define a contract. You can think of a contract similar to a class in any object-oriented programming like Java or JavaScript. Let's go ahead and give our contract a name here. We're going to call ours Simple Storage. Okay. You should probably name the contract the same as what you name the file. I want to use curly braces. And then we add. Oh, sweet. Using curly braces. Add this little open and closed curly brackets. Everything inside this open and closed curly brackets is going to be the contents of. Does line six need a semicolon? This contract simple storage. Now, if we go ahead and hit Command S or Control S, we can see this little green check mark show up. 
And if you don't, you can always go back to the compiler tab, scroll down and hit compile and see the little green check mark. That little green check mark means that our code is compiling successfully and we don't have any errors. We could hypothetically deploy this contract right now and it would be a valid contract. So congratulations on writing your first contract. Sweet. I feel like maybe having going through like an entire section is good enough for today, but sure. Apparently we're just never going to have a, a ad ever again. Now Solidity has multiple different types or primitive data types. And if you go to the Solidity documentation, which again is in our GitHub repository, you can read more and learn more about the different types that are in here. The four most basic types are going to be Boolean, uint, int, and an address, or bytes, which is a lower level type, which we'll talk about a little bit later. A Boolean defines some type of true-false. A uint is going to be an unsigned integer, which means it's going to be a whole number that isn't positive or negative, it's just positive. We have an integer, which is going to be a positive or negative whole number. And then we have an address, which is going to be an address, like what we see in our MetaMask here. There are some other types as well that you'll learn later on. The reason that we have these types. Strings? Do we know strings? Is we use them to define what different variables. And you know what? F it. We're going to, we're definitely going to use, just write that. Um, Boolean UI uint int address and uh, bytes. Sorry. Variables are basically holders for different values. For example, we could create a variable called has favorite number to represent if somebody has a favorite number. And we would put this bool keyword before has favorite number to say, okay, we have a variable called has favorite number and it's of type Boolean. So this has favorite number is gonna represent a true or a false. To set its value, we could say has favorite number equals true. Now has favorite number is going to be true. We could also say has favorite number equals false. So this Boolean has favorite number is now going to be false. For a uint, we could say uint favorite number equals and then set a number, one, two, three. This means that our favorite number is going to be one, two, three. Uint is special because we can actually specify how many bits we want to allocate to this number. Bits and bytes are pretty fundamental pieces of information for computer science. We're not gonna go over it here, However, there's a fantastic video in the GitHub repository that explains it more. Basically, it's how much storage or memory to allocate to this number. How big can it get? If we say a uint 8, it can have 8 bits all the way up to uint 256. If you don't specify how big it is, it automatically defaults to uint 256. Oftentimes, it's better when writing our code to be very explicit. So usually you'll see me just do uint 256 to represent a uint 256. We could also do an int favorite number equals one, two, three, or an int 256. I'm just gonna go ahead and add this Boolean back here. We're gonna change this back to uint 256. And let's change our favorite number to five here. We could also do something called strings. String favorite number in text equals five. Strings represent basically words, and you can represent them by putting them in these quotes. It's gonna be which is why I was surprised when you didn't, you know, include the a string as a common type because, like, it's a string. Some word or phrase or really, really just kind of any combination of keystrokes in here. Our ints can be positive or negative. So we could say negative five or positive five. Both are going to be valid ints. We can also do address. My address equals and grab our address right from MetaMask, paste it in. You'll notice that we end all of these lines of code with... Okay, I'm actually gonna do the address one. Because, and hear me out, 
Um, I would have guessed that that would have had to be enclosed in quotes. Never mind. UX. Okay. With the semicolon. We can also have bytes objects or a bytes 32. Again, representing how many bytes we want them to be. And this says that we have called favorite bytes. And we're just going to set it equal to cat. So strings are actually really interesting because strings are secretly just bytes objects, but only for text. So cat is actually a string but can automatically get converted into one of these bytes objects. Bytes objects typically look like 0x and then some random letters and numbers that represent the bytes object. But cat can automatically get converted down to bytes. We'll talk about bytes more in coming sessions. You could also do bytes 2, bytes 3, bytes 5, bytes 22. You get the picture. For our uints and our int 256, the lowest we can go is 8 bits because 8 bits is a byte, and we can go up by steps of 8. So we can do 8. 16, 32, etc., all the way to 256. For example, down here, we can't do bytes 64. And if we go ahead and try to compile this, we get a little red thing here. And if we scroll down, we get a declaration error, identifier not found or not unique, byte 64, favorite bytes equals cats. And we even get a little red warning sign here in our remix. This is remix telling us there's something wrong with this line. So we can switch back to byte 32, since bytes 32 is the maximum size that a bytes can be. You could also do just a bytes object, which means it can have any size. But we typically want to be explicit, and we're going to stick with bytes 32. Because it is a smart contract, um, and you want it to be the smallest amount possible. For now. If you want to learn more about the different types and how to use them and all the different features with them, be sure to check out the Solidity documentation. For now, for our simple storage, let's say we only want to store numbers. So let's go ahead and delete everything except for the favorite number section. I'm not actually following along because this is really simple stuff. Um, So, two fifty six is interesting. Uh, sorry, two fifty six, and these are camel case. Um, I was saying something, but I lost my train of thought, so there is that. Now, in Solidity, if I do this and I remove the equals 5, this favorite number actually does get set to a default value. The default value for Solidity is going to be whatever the null value is, which in Solidity's case is 0. So saying u and 256 favorite number is going to be the same as saying u and 256 favorite number equals zero, since it gets initialized to zero. So for now, let's not initialize it to anything so that favorite number will automatically start off as zero. Now, if you get confused as you're coding along and you're following along with me, be sure to write comments in your code so you know what's going on. So maybe for example, a great comment here would be this gets initialized to zero. And then if that's even con Initialized, initialized. Um, so apparently zero is neutral. Confusing you, you could say this means that this section is a comment. Now let's go ahead and create a function. Functions or methods are self-contained modules that will execute some specific set of instructions for us when we call it. If you're familiar with Java or Python or JavaScript or anything like that, functions work the exact same way. Functions get identified by the keyword function. 
let's create a function called store. Store what? Do we get to have parentheses and link curly braces? that will change the value of favorite number to some new value. And the number that we're gonna change it to. Are we allowed to have a space here, like make it readable? It's gonna be variables that are passed to our store function. A good way to find that out is if we just say, oh no, what's wrong? Is it like, I'm sorry, you wanted to have readable code? So we're going to allow our store function to take a variable of type uint256 and we'll call it underscore favorite number. We'll make this a public function, which we'll get to in a minute. And all we're going to do is we're going to set favorite number equal to whatever variable that we just passed. So now... So we have store and we have... A defined variable, we've made it public, and we have set is equal to okay. So you're not allowed to have an empty function, I'm assuming, or I just didn't do the private public, uh, usually, like. With object oriented programming, which is bullshit. Um, it's reasons why people get paid thousands of dollars to, to do solidity contracts. But yeah, public, everything should be private unless it needs to be public. Um, nothing should be anything's business. If it's private, like a third party thing can't call into it. We have this function called store that. It takes some parameter that we're going to give it, and it sets this favorite number variable equal to whatever number that we give this function. Now, to see this actually in action, let's deploy this to an even faker blockchain than a testnet. We're going to actually deploy this to a local network or a JavaScript VM. And first, before we can even do that, let's just make sure that it's compiling correctly. Looks like we have a green check mark. Okay, let's manually compile this shit stuff. Okay. I don't know what, okay, that's fine. Which is good. And we'll come down to this button here, which is our deploy and run transaction. Just tab. Our deploy and run transactions tab has a ton of different configuration pieces for actually deploying this contract. First, we want to make sure we are on the JavaScript VM London piece here. JavaScript VM means we're going to be deploying to a fake local JavaScript VM. The JavaScript VM is a fake local blockchain where we can simulate transactions really quickly without having to wait for them to go through on a testnet. Don't worry about the London versus Berlin piece here for now. Injected Web3 and Web3 provider we'll talk about in a little bit. We also have this account section here. When we run on our fake JavaScript VM, we're given a whole bunch of fake accounts from where to deploy from. And we're given 100 ETH for each one of these fake accounts. You can kind of think of it similar to our MetaMask account in MetaMask. Except for the difference here is that this is this fake JavaScript VM Ethereum that we're given. For our transactions, including deploying contracts, we're actually given a gas limit. There's also values we can send and we can choose our contracts. Right now, we only have one contract, simple storage, so that's going to be the one that we're going to deploy. So on the left-hand side, to deploy this to our fake JavaScript VM, we're going to go ahead and hit the Deploy button. And if we scroll all the way down to the bottom now, we can see a contract was deployed. It says simple storage at x blah, 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 blah. And we see this orange button store with kind of this gray text UN256 
underscore favorite number. On our fake local blockchain, right? Okay, so deployed contracts. Ah, uh, this one. actually given an address. Every single smart contract it has an address, just like how our wallets have an address. So if we hit this copy button here, and we put it into a comment, make this a little bit bigger, we can see that the address of this contract that we just deployed is located at this address. Additionally, if you pull up the slider over here, you'll be able to see this little green check mark with all its information about this deployment. You can hit the little drop down and see a whole lot more information about this. Something you might notice is you'll see some familiar keywords like status, transaction hash, from, to, gas, etc. When we deploy a contract, it's actually the same as sending a transaction. Remember, anytime we do anything on the blockchain, we modify any value, we are sending a transaction. So deploying a contract is modifying the blockchain to have this contract. It's modifying the state of the blockchain. And if we had sent this on a RinkB or a Coven or a mainnet network, we would have had to spend the gas to actually deploy this contract. And this is the simulation of how much gas and the transaction hash and from and to and all this other stuff about our transaction had we actually deployed it to a real network. But since it's JavaScript VM, it's all fake information. Now we have this big orange button store. This big orange button resembles the store function that we just created. So if we add some number into this store, like one, two, three, and we hit the store button, we actually call this store button and we actually execute a transaction on our fake JavaScript blockchain to store the number one, two, three, our favorite number. And if we scroll all the way up to our account now, you'll see that we have a little bit less ether in our fake account. This is because Okay, we're in the middle of the explanation at 2 hours, 23 minutes, 32 seconds, but I need to go to bed. So, this was a good, this is a good place to stop for me. I don't know how it was for you, but, um, yeah, congratulations. We got through our first smart contract together. Um, tomorrow we will probably backtrack a little bit and get the rest of this explanation when I am not being um, antsy about time and, you know, sleep and stuff. So, um, thank you very much for hanging out with me after hours. And um, hopefully this was informative for you. Thank you. Like, subscribe. Bye.